Yeah, pressure is increasing, of course. Thank you very much. And of course, thank you uh, for the invitation and to be here at this wonderful conference. I already enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, so, uh, of course, I feel this a big honor and a, and a real privilege to, uh, to present here uh, some of my work uh, in a conference that is organized in the honor of, uh, of Stephen, uh, whom I admired a lot. And in fact, uh, my work has been inspired by him uh, uh, to a large extent. Um, what I would like to uh, uh, go through um, is uh, an, 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 an issue or a debate that uh, Stephen was uh, working on in more recent years. Right, starting with his uh, paper uh, uh, in Management Science, published in 2007 on the Detroit uh, uh, case. Uh, and you all know that paper. So uh, I would like to uh, um, uh, go through a, a number of topics. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, about the debate, but we have already gone into that uh, uh, in, in previous presentations, so I won't say too much about that. Secondly, I uh, was quite ambitious, and in fact, I produced a paper on this. Uh, so if you're interested, of course, I can send that to you. Please email me. Um, but uh, uh, one of the questions I raised in the paper is how new was Kleber's spin-off theory on in the industry clustering? Uh, then I did an analysis on the impact of Kleber's spin-off theory on the community of economic geography, geographers broadly defined. So uh, economic geographers proper, but also regional and urban economists. It's, it's quite... Uh, a, a large group of schoolers that are all involved in uh, location of firms, location of industries, um, and, and, and I'm part of that community, so that's uh, uh, why I'm heavily interested in that. And I would like to explore some new research avenues in context of Clapper's work, and I have to do that in 13 minutes, so that's quite a, an, an, a challenge, uh, but of course I will do all my best to do that. Um, so, of course, Marshall versus Klepper, I called it. But, of course, agglomeration economics is much more about, uh, about Marshall, but just to put it simple. And it is a very old question in economic geography. Why do industries uh, cluster in space? Now, of course, uh, we already heard that, and you're familiar with that. Marshall said, okay, uh, firms can benefit, uh, benefit from each other co-presence uh, due to localization economies that, that might arise because of knowledge spillovers, labor market pooling, and, and the excess of specialized suppliers. And then uh, there uh, uh, came Clapper, and he provided a completely alternative theory that really challenged the foundations of this Marshallian thinking, uh, 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 stressing uh, uh, the role of uh, spin-offs. Uh, uh, he uh, um, uh, uh, depicted uh, uh, cluster formation as a process in which a few successful uh, uh, parent firms uh, pass uh, their competences to new generations of spin or firms in the same location, and through that, uh, through that snowball process, uh, uh, spatial clustering of an industry takes place. So you can imagine what, how, what, how radical that view was uh, in, in the community of economic geographers that always uh, uh, was, was, were focusing on agglomeration externalities as an explanation for why industry cluster in space. And in a way, it is a very simple theory, right? Uh, uh, but uh, uh, a very groundbreaking at the same time. Um, to assess um, uh, um, uh, the work uh, of, uh, of Stephen, I, I went into the literature and uh, see that to what extent uh, 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 in the past, schoolers have, had already talked about the role of spin-off activity uh, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, provided an explanation for why industries cluster in space. And amazingly, papers already in the 1960s and the 1970s were already underlining the role of spin-off activity, especially in high-tech industries in Silicon Valley, but also in the, uh, Route uh, 128 in the Boston area. Uh, quite many papers uh, 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 that already um, uh, 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 drew attention to that. But they never challenged the Marshallian thesis. It was just on top of, uh, of, of the, uh, the more traditional, conventional explanations uh, of Marshallian externalities uh, uh, in which they uh, brought up this uh, role of spin-off activities. Of course, in the 1990s, there were a lot of entry models uh, in an industry life cycle perspective that provided an explanation for why industries cluster in space. And basically, what they said is, it is that, that entry dry spatial clustering. And especially here I will refer to the work of uh, Olaf Sørensen and colleagues who, uh, who uh, made the claim and in fact uh, uh, empirically validated that, uh, that there is a positive effect of what they called regional density on entry and exit rates. 
So, so clusters uh, 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 are kind of stimulating environment for firms to enter, but it's also hard, a hard environment to survive in the, in the long run. So, and that, of course, goes again against this Marshallian externality. So, what, uh, what that implied is that industry uh, clustering could occur in the absence of agglomeration in externalities. And, I, and this is what Stephen really found a really exciting idea. He, he, he in fact, refer to the work of, uh, of Olaf Sørensen and, and, and colleagues uh, to underline that. And what Clipper uh, really did in that perspective is that industry clustering was not due to high entry in clusters per se, and that was the claim made by those entry models, but due to local entry of spin-offs that originate from successful parents, which therefore show lower exit rates. And this, is, I think, uh, was, the, was the achievement uh, that uh, uh, Clapper brought this to the community. Well, a bit, uh, a, a, a very quick overview of uh, um, uh, what I think was the impact of Stephen's uh, 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 spin-off or her theory uh, on the community of economic geographers, because, as I said, it fundamentally challenged uh, 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 one of their main pillars uh, of, of, of thinking. Um, I, I just did an, a citation analysis, for example, uh, uh, looking at uh, 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 the papers that uh, uh, Stephen uh, published uh, in the last, de last decades. I used Scopus for that. I did the uh, analysis at, on the 12th of July 2014. And here you can see from 1996 to 2013 the numbers of forward citations that Clapper received in that time, uh, during that period. Uh, and to total citations of 2,741. Um, and of course, I was interested in to what extent those citations has been uh, uh, um, uh, uh, received um, in economic geography journals. And I identified 28 journals that cite this, uh, uh, Clapper's work uh, that could be associated with this broad field of economic geography as I defined it before. And there I found a, a, a total of uh, 243 citations, as you can see. And of course, as I said before, most of the work that Stephen worked on uh, uh, in, in terms of geography and in terms of indus industry clustering originated uh, uh, from his 2007 paper and, 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 and papers that he published uh, uh, after that. So what you might already see here is that there is some kind of slow but gradual increase uh, of citations to Clapper work in economic geography journals with a peak in the year 2011, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure there, there, there are many to come. So uh, what, uh, uh, and when I see how uh, 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 Clapper is cited, I mean, it can also be very negative citations, right? So this is not the way to go forward, and, uh, and, 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 and let's uh, just proceed and explore more uh, the effect of agglomeration externalities as they did already for many decades. But what I found is that the, 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 the citations he received in those economic geography journals, they were all positive. Uh, so he met really little opposition in the field of economic geography. This might also have something to do with the rather fragmented nature of the field in which you have a lot of kind of islands that really do not communicate with each other. So that might also be partly an explanation for that. Um, for sure, Clapper's theory has become a main pillar of uh, an, an, a new and expanding uh, uh, literature on evolution economic geography. I'm, I'm, in, I'm involved myself very much so. It's one of, been of the most successful applications. We have been heavily inspired by, 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 by Stephen's work on, uh, on uh, industry clustering. And in fact, uh, many st uh, empirical studies has come out of that uh, in, in, in most recent years. But especially his uh, uh, inspiration that we received from was, uh, um, would be related to what uh, we call the regional branching literature, which is more about the formation of new industries and how strongly rooted they are in local related industries, out of which new industries grow and recombine capabilities from local related industries. So if you have an environment in which there's a high presence of industries that are technologically related to each other, it provides opportunities for regions to diversify into new but related industries, and that is a principal driver of the process of diversification. So here you see already there's some kind of uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, influence of, of Clapper's work that has been taken up in this, uh, in this literature uh, in economic geography, again broadly defined. Um, 
Well, um, then about, yeah, then about uh, uh, Marshall versus Clapper. Uh, let me just underline um, um, uh, that there are an, uh, a number of questions which I think need to be taken up, uh, which are still open or uh, need more evidence in the context of Clapper's uh, heritage theory. And Clapper was indeed the first to admit that acceleration economies cannot be, uh, be ruled out entirely in his own studies. And there, and there are many examples of that. And just let me go uh, 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 through a few of those. Industry specific, uh, specificity. Um, of course, most of the, 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 the empirical studies have been uh, carried out in manufacturing industries, right? So uh, now there, ha there, have, there are some studies that look at creative project-based industries, and what they tend to uh, uh, show is that localization economies matter, right? So local bus is important, uh, 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 local social networks that you, uh, that you need to access to is crucial for the survival of those firms in creative uh, uh, project-based industries. So here again, industry speci uh, specificity is important. Uh, another thing, and this is what Klepper himself uh, uh, stated, is that not all industries exhibit extreme spatial clustering. And for him, it was a kind of question, is, it might, uh, might that be uh, uh, due to the fact that spin-off activity is not that intense in all industries, and that's why they uh, show different uh, tendencies uh, to cluster in space. It's an interesting question, nobody has taken that up and should be explored more in detail. Well, uh, if you talk about agglomeration economies, it's not only about Marshall, I mean, there's a huge literature uh, uh, you have Jacob's externalities, right? Uh, the all benefits that you, can, uh, that you can enjoy when being part of a diversified environment. Um, um, but also local related externalities, uh, 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 as they are called, they seem to matter a lot. Uh, so uh, 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 what we tend to find in many studies uh, uh, that indeed if a new industry is born in, an, in, a, in a region where there is already a high presence of related industries, uh, uh, firms in those new industries have a higher survival rate. So here you have a type of agglomeration externality that indeed stimulates and increases the performance of local firms in clusters. Um, another thing that we should, I think, uh, address more attention to in this type of literature is that not all types of firms are expected to benefit from agglomeration economies, as firms are heterogeneous in their capabilities. Such, such as spin-off in clusters, and just let me, and, 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 and Stephen was uh, uh, um, uh, uh, very much convinced uh, uh, about that himself in his uh, um, uh, Detroit paper, in fact, and there are now I, uh, in fact stated, and now I quote, it is possible that acceleration economies in the Detroit area were significant, but only benefited spin-offs, perhaps because only they had suitable pre-entry backgrounds to benefit from acceleration economies it is hard to rule out such the theory, right? So even in his, in his paper where he said, okay, uh, uh, we have to reject the Marcellian thesis in favor of a spin-off thesis, he is not even excluding himself the fact that acceleration uh, uh, economies might still operate and are important. Um, and then, uh, so I think, and this is also what I felt uh, truly in, in the last work uh, uh, that Stever did, uh, did is to have follow-up studies that we are much more precise about uh, uh, showing uh, the presence of uh, uh, Marshallian externalities. And uh, 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 the labor mobility issue is, is one thing. Um, and in fact, he started up a, a, a number of papers uh, um, uh, that were on that, the role of labor mobility for entry and survival of firms in clusters. And what he, in, uh, 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 what indeed uh, 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 was shown in those papers is that labor, labor pooling is not a general externality available to all firms in clusters, but available to spin-offs that recruit employ employees from their parents or from firms with, with whom the founder of the spin-off interacted before while still working for the parent. Right? So it's an abs it, it is, uh, it's, there's really a kind of direct link with the spin-off process in a way. But for me it's still hard to see whether, that, whether you still can exclude uh, a labor market externalities to operate in that respect. Because it might still be the case that the employees that are hired, they have become much more smarter uh, being part of a cluster for, for, for a long period of time. 
and therefore if you recruit those, yeah, you can benefit uh, 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 from those uh, superior employees uh, uh, as a spin-off company. Uh, and so we have to be uh, much more careful and uh, we have to define a, a, a much better identified identification strategy uh, to see uh, whether the spin-off thesis versus the Marshallian thesis uh, uh, will hold in the end. Uh, uh, last but not least, and then I will stop, um, is the role of institutions. Well, we had just had the discussions about uh, 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 um, uh, innovation systems. Uh, uh, to me, innovation systems is really about institutions. Uh, 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 and I think that is what the theory is really about. And uh, uh, the role of institutions cannot be ignored in this type of studies, and we should account for that much more seriously. Stephen was not really uh, 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 very willing to take that up in his own research. But again, if you look at his publications, he made some remarks on that. For example, uh, he was always wondering why uh, the entry activity in semiconductors in Silicon Valley was that high, so extremely high. And then he said, well, maybe it, it could be the, uh, the case uh, um, that that might be influenced by the fact that uh, uh, in, in the U.S., uh, you have uh, uh, state laws of employees non-competes uh, that differ very much between states. And, and in fact, in Silicon Valley, those restrictions on labor mobility were almost absent in that respect. And that could provide an explanation why there was so, such a high entry activity uh, in, in, the, in, the, in Silicon Valley itself. And that is what he actually wrote down uh, uh, once or twice in, in, in his publications. So I think uh, 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 to underline, and I think institutions are also really part of exploration externality literature. Yeah? And Marshall didn't say too much about that, but but it is but it is really part of of, of the whole exploration externality literature, going back to the industrial district literature, uh, the, well, the regional innovation system literature, and we should not uh, uh, forget about that. And if we really want to have a test on exploration economies and whether they matter or not, I think we should at least test uh, for those uh, uh, potential explanations. Okay, thank you for your attention. And because of excellent time management, we have time for one or two questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, excellent time management on your behalf, not mine. <laughs> or uh, just an observation. Uh, it, it, around uh, our area, North Carolina, I, I've got to say that uh, labor markets are, are fundamental to uh, whether you know, uh, biotech firms, uh, software firms taking off. I mean, I, I know any number of people who's, who, who, who actually did one startup, but then that went under, and they had to leave the region because the, the markets, uh, the, the demand wasn't uh, uh, thick enough uh, uh, to absorb that. And then, you have the flip side, it's a you know, chicken and egg uh, on the uh, supply side as well, the people who get it. So it works both ways. So I, I frankly uh, believe that that's a, a, a fundamental feature. Uh, one of, I think, possibly several, but certainly uh, it, it just from other data, from Kurz's work, from, you know, Glazer and so on. You know, it's, uh, it's pretty important, and that, but it's important to say that it's not mutually exclusive with Steve's no. uh, insights. Absolutely. So to set this up as an either or no. is surely it's not the right way to do no. it. They, these things are operating and you know, Absolutely. And, and really complement one another, in my view, as uh, explanations. Nonetheless, your earlier points about really being careful about identification and so on, I think you're, you're, you're just right. No, I cannot agree more. I mean, there the, uh, uh, are two alternative explanations, but they are not mutually exclusive, right? They can, they can be both true. Right. Uh, and, well, let's see what happens, right? Uh, let's do the empirical studies and see uh, 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 whether we can provide uh, uh, um, uh, empirical evidence for both. Or one of them. Sure. That's good. I should have said time for one or two questions, or one West Cohen question. <laughs> 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 we'll make sure we have some time for some conversation. Uh, first of all, thank you to David uh, for inviting me to uh, come to this event uh, in memory of Stephen. Uh, 
Stephen invited me to come to Carnegie Mellon right after my PhD was finished in London. Uh, I remember it distinctly because I traveled to Pittsburgh for the first time on August 27, 1997. Why is that date important? It was the date of the funeral of Princess Di, which meant that I had to be at the airport eight hours before the flight to avoid uh, the funeral parade. Uh, the reason why Stephen invited me in 1997 uh, to come here uh, when all my research during my PhD was on uh, location and clusters and innovation uh, and based on agglomeration economies when at the time he had shown or published any work uh, related with geography was essentially to, I found, to sit me down in his office and have long talks with me to convince me that agglomeration economies didn't necessarily matter, uh, which he managed to do in about a month. Uh, so, uh, what uh, I'm going to present today, and uh, the title of the presentation is completely different, and the presentation is completely different from the one that is in the program, is essentially to uh, pick up from something that happened uh, many years after I left Carnegie Mellon, when uh, together with Francisco Veloso and other colleagues in Portugal, we started uh, the Carnegie Mellon Portugal PhD program in technological change and entrepreneurship, of which uh, Stephen was uh, the greatest champion here at Carnegie Mellon and uh, the main responsible for uh, taking this uh, ambitious project off the ground. As part of this PhD program, several students uh, were supervised by Stephen and some of them together with me. One of the students, Carla Costa, who is uh, the co-author of this paper, studied the Portuguese molds industry, uh, actually I think from an original suggestion by Francisco, uh, to look at uh, what kind of implications uh, the ideas of uh, Stephen about the drivers of clusters uh, would have in an industry that is fundamentally different from the oligopolies that uh, Stephen and his co-author studied uh, both when looking at industry evolution and his industry location. Uh, the Portuguese molds industry is typically a, a southern European uh, industry, average size of entrants about six employees, average size of incumbents about 11, uh, it is highly networked, it works pretty much with companies accessing capabilities from other companies in order to fulfill uh, orders, uh, very much in the way that uh, Brian Lowesby and Richard Langlois uh, wrote about uh, years ago. Uh, it is highly fragmented, but also highly networked uh, and very much uh, concentrated uh, on uh, one region which is away from both Lisbon and Porto, which are the main uh, uh, metropolitan areas of Portugal. Uh, what we eventually found out is that not only Stephen's insights or main uh, uh, stylized facts that emerged from a lot of his research uh, with co-authors on uh, the evolution of industries, market structure, and location did apply, but uh, in fact a lot more than just the issue of location applied to the industry. Uh, basically, uh, this is just a short uh, outline of some of the insights that uh, Stephen's work with his co-authors generated, the idea that the inception and emergency of an emergence of an industry is associated with precursor industries and diversification from incumbents in precursor industries. Incumbents serve as, as training grounds for spin-off founders. Uh, involuntary spin-offs inherit competences from parent companies. Uh, spin-offs sometimes arise from disagreements between stakeholders. Clustering 
can emerge because of agglomeration economies, but most often, most of the clustering effect uh, usually emerges simply from the location of spin-offs to the, the choice of spin-offs to locate close to their parent companies, and subsequent cluster growth is dominated by spin-offs associated with innovation, commercialization, and design. This uh, came from a variety of works, uh, Stephen with Ken Simons on uh, TV uh, and radio, uh, Stephen, with, uh, Stephen on the automobile industry, finding that first uh, there is an advantage from diversifiers from precursor industries, then there is an advantage from uh, spin-offs from the, the leading companies. Uh, the idea that spin-offs take advantage of sub-markets, differentiate products, uh, but stay sometimes close uh, to their parents in the product space, uh, as uh, Stephen and Sally uh, uh, found out in, in their paper in Management Science in 2005. Uh, disagreements uh, within the work by Klepper and Thompson, and also Thompson and Jing Shen, uh, and then uh, performance being determined more by quality of employees than actually uh, agglomeration externalities or any economies arising from agglom agglomeration. Uh, this eventually led to the, the papers uh, on uh, lasers and on uh, tires and on automobiles with, uh, with, Gu with Guido and uh, also by Clapper Solo. Uh, the paper with Cristina Curie is another PhD student from the Carnegie Mellon Portugal program. Uh, and uh, the essential idea is that uh, the better firms generate better spin-offs. If they locate close to the parents, then uh, an endogenous process generates a cluster without uh, any need for uh, agglomeration economies or with little need for agglomeration economies. The Portuguese molds industry. Uh, essentially, it is a very fragmented industry concentrated strongly in uh, one region, small region, away from Lisbon and Porto. It's recognized as one of the principal producers of uh, precision molds. Uh, it exports uh, about 80% of the production at its peak around the 1980s, it exported more than 90% of its production. So it is a successful industry and yet uh, remains very much a typical Southern European uh, industry based on very small companies and the community of producers that uh, network between themselves. So very little to do with tires or lasers uh, in that sense. Um, so let's then have a, a go through the history of the industry from the beginning. The first thing that uh, appeared in Carla's research going through the history of the industry and uh, reading through reports and papers and uh, books about uh, its history was that, in fact, uh, the reason for location uh, was associated with the predecessor industry, glass. Uh, glass was established in the region uh, by an act of industrial policy <coughs> by the king, in the Portuguese king in 1769. He invited, the, he picked a winner, uh, William <laughs> Stevens, uh, an English industrialist. Uh, he, uh, in an act of typical Portuguese industrial policy, he waived any taxes on uh, profits, any taxes on exports or imports, and gave, them free, gave him free use of uh, the forest in Leiria, which was the main reason why uh, the, the factory was installed in that place. It, had, it was both close to the beach and the sand, and close to a very large forest. So this Royal Glass Factory was installed in 1769, 
and uh, specialized workers were imported from Italy, Belgium, France, England. Uh, they taught Portuguese apprentices. Uh, and uh, the Steven, Stevens and his brother managed the company for uh, close to 50 years, until, uh, until 1826. During this period, uh, a lot of specialized, uh, specialized workforce emerged in the, in, in the region. A lot of small firms emerged around the Royal Glass Factory. It created a, a specific culture in the region, what was called an aristocratic proletariat, uh, that found socioeconomic fulfillment in establishing uh, small businesses. Uh, so it sort of created uh, an environment that was propitious for uh, a high uh, supply of entrepreneurs. Uh, this happened about 100 years before uh, anyone thought about molds. Uh, in 1920, uh, by 1920, uh, most of the glass uh, companies in Marinha still ordered molds for glass from abroad. It was in 1925 that uh, a worker from the Royal Factory uh, decided to leave, asked permission, and created an independent molds workshop with a very skilled operator uh, who was able to create molds by the name Antonio Sanch and uh, his half brother. And they produced the first die casting mold for glass. Uh, they did spend and traveled a lot, these three men, uh, during this period to learn their trade, but they eventually located the workshop next to their parent company, the glass company. Uh, at about the same time, the first plastics companies were established, first in Lisbon, then in Marinha, uh, and the firm, uh, one firm, Nobre Silva, uh, was created in Marinha essentially uh, to produce espadrilles to take advantage of regulations that commanded the population to stop from walking barefoot. Uh, and they took advantage of that opportunity, created uh, a company. Uh, the, a company was created to do this. Eventually, they took advantage of other technological innovations like Bakelite to produce other uh, things. And Soon, other plastic companies also located in Marinha. Uh, the original people, uh, Abranch, Rock, and Sant, who had created the first workshop for glass molds, uh, then started experimenting with uh, molds for plastic, which were technologically similar. These experiments then led to a disagreement between uh, Rock and a branch who were actually half brothers. They had different ideas of what to pursue. They had a, a strategic disagreement in the, in the style of, of Clapper and Thompson, uh, and that took them towards separate paths. Rock stayed with glass, a branch uh, pursued plastic molds. Uh, in 1946, the main technological advance associated with uh, plastics, the creation of thermoplastic resins, was introduced. And then at that moment, the first uh, company, Portuguese company, AHA, uh, was established by a branch in Marinha again. Uh, it produced a series of innovations, uh, particularly in the division of labor, but mostly what it did was to serve as a training ground for another generation of uh, skilled operators who then went on to create their own uh, small firms, uh, usually uh, taking advantage from the fact that molds are unique products. You need to deal with your customer and create a completely new mold. There are no economies of scale. You do a new thing every time you do a new mold. and different people specialize in different styles of molds. So differentiation, sub-markets are almost infinite. So what we had was a multiplication of firms of five or six people uh, producing molds uh, made uh, to custom. Uh, this is just a, a, 
uh, a genealogy of the first uh, Moltz companies in Marinha, uh, most of them traced to AHA. Uh, eventually, from the 1950s, uh, exports started to become the norm. Uh, and particularly from the 1970s with the explosion of the electronics industry, uh, computers, uh, the use of plastics in automobiles, uh, the industry experienced uh, an explosion in terms of growth. During this period, uh, startups literally emerged overnight. Uh, you had years where uh, hundreds of new companies were created and hundreds of new companies were closed. Uh, and all of them, or almost all of them, in Marinha. Uh, in fact, uh, what happened eventually during the 1980s was that uh, spin-offs started emerging not from production, not from skilled operators, but from people working on design, commercial departments, on international markets that knew the customers, knew the specifications, and then used the regional network to access uh, the people who actually would be able to produce those uh, specialized molds. Uh, so essentially, uh, you have very much in the style of uh, the paper by Goldman and Clapper, a second wave of spin-offs that emerges not from producers, not from knowledge that is inherited from uh, parent companies, but from knowledge uh, that comes from the market, from design, uh, from uh, innovation. Uh, the industry kept growing until about uh, the early 2000s. Uh, the cluster grew faster than the industry until about 2000. And uh, eventually, this is all I wanted to tell you. Uh, I could tell you a lot more, in but essentially, uh, just to, to close up, the idea is that uh, we can find in an industry that is as far away as possible from the oligopolies that Stephen studied, such as automobiles, a lot of features that emerge from his work. Uh, the association with predecessor industries, diversifiers uh, from predecessor industries, molds for glass and glass, then uh, the emergence of the industry based on spin-offs uh, that come from the first successful uh, parent company. Uh, that parent company is created because of a disagreement a strategic disagreement between two people about which technology or which product to pursue. Uh, then the involuntary spin-off process, uh, the clustering that emerges from that process, and the subsequent growth uh, associated with spin-offs that are no longer, no longer technological, but mostly about markets, design, uh, and uh, product innovation. Thank you. Um, and honored to tell you about a research project I did with Steve Klepper um, and that presents a refinement of his heritage theory and I think really a model that synthesizes a lot of the ideas that all of you have talked about already. Um, but before jumping right into talking about the research project itself, I'd just like to speak a minute about working with Steve because I can't tell you how, how enjoyable a process it was to just walk into his office and hear some of his stories about the various industries that we were, uh, that we were using as inspiration for this model. Um, and he would just tell me each day some new story about uh, how Fairchild you know, barely made it off the ground or something and, and uh, was able to, to uh, become the leader in this whole new industry. And I, was just, I really enjoyed um, hearing, hearing these stories from Stephen. And in some sense, what I'd like to do with this model is tell you all a story because that's really what a mathematical model is able to do. Um, it's not going to be able to say that this is a correct theory, but it, hopefully it'll show you that it's a theory that explains a lot of the evidence that's out there. Um, and indeed, um, in, in, indeed, I think it's consistent with a lot of the other 
uh, insights that people have brought up today. All right, so the story I'm going to tell you involves agglomeration, and we already have a familiar story for agglomeration that involves these Marshallian uh, externalities, or maybe localized externalities more generally. And the story is at best incomplete, because it doesn't tell us why these industry clusters that we see often seem to um, grow through the entry of spin-off firms. Uh -huh. And often, these spin-off firms can trace back to a single successful firm um, that, uh, that the, that, that the uh, new firm sort of emerged out of. And so we have some unanswered questions about, the, about this spin-off process and about clusters more generally um, that uh, we'd like to address. So the first question is, why do firms agglomerate specifically in innovative industries? Uh, and the second question is then, why is so much of the entry that's driving this growth of these clusters coming in the form of spin-offs as opposed to other entrants? And then lastly, why are these spin-offs typically so successful, often becoming the leaders uh, in, these, in these clusters in which, they, in which they enter? And so there's going to be three parts to our explanation. Um, hopefully each part will be pretty simple. So the underlying piece of our model is going to be this insight that firms grow through innovation and spinoffs form when there's opportunities to form through innovation. And we're just going to assume that spinoffs are always going to locate close to their parents. Um, always is clearly an exaggeration, but there's a lot of evidence that they do. Um, and it's this assumption that spinoffs are locating close to our parents that's going to generate clustering in the model because we're not going to assume any additional agglomeration externalities. You could specifically think that just the, the ability for spinoffs to form is like some kind of externality, but the important thing is that it's restricted just to spinoffs so that other workers who ha might be in the region can't similarly benefit from this externality. So we have innovation that's creating the opportunity for spinoffs to form and the opportunity for firms to grow. And then we're going to assume that some innovation leads to more innovation. So there's going to be a positive feedback dynamic where the more innovations a firm has already discovered, the more opportunities there are to discover more. And this is going to be because innovations build on the existing innovations that have already been discovered. So, when a spin-off forms to pursue one of these new innovations, it's going to be based on an innovation that came before it. That means the spin-off is going to be producing in a submarket that's similar to the submarkets or to one of the submarkets that its parent firm um, had already pursued. And then, because these submarkets are going to be similar in some respects, the spin-off performance is going to correlate with the parent's performance. And in particular, if we have spin-offs from a very successful incumbent firm, we might expect those spin-offs to themselves become more successful and indeed perhaps become leaders of their industry. So we're drawing on evidence uh, that not just Steve, but the whole community has, um, has uh, discovered by doing this nanoeconomics approach in five industries. Um, that are known to be clustered. So we are selecting on clustered industries to investigate for our inspiration for this model. And we're looking at the automobile industry, which was uh, clustered in, in Detroit and seemed to grow out of the spin-offs from General Motors. We're looking at the tire industry in Akron that seemed to grow out of the spin-offs of Goodrich. The semiconductor industry in Silicon Valley growing out of Fairchild, which for most of you know. The disk drive industry also in Silicon Valley growing out of IBM. And Biotherapeutics had a few clusters. We're focusing just on the San Diego cluster, which grew out of hybrid tech. And so we're going to begin just by looking back through this existing research and identifying a set of 11 stylized facts, which we're going to try to explain in this paper. And uh, the stylized fact first is that these industries that tend to be clustered, uh, or say 
let me say it the other way around, the industries that are very innovative tend to be more clustered. Certainly those five industries that I just showed you were all innovative in their time. Secondly, that how these clusters grew was predominantly through entry. And thirdly, that most of these entrants that, uh, that entered in the cluster were spin-offs. So there were more, um, more, more of the entrants uh, in the clusters were spin-offs than entrants elsewhere in the industry. Um, not only are there more of these spin-offs in clusters, but these spin-offs tend to be more successful. So we have a disproportionate share of the leaders in these industries being these spin-offs that enter in these clusters. And in some cases, not in all cases, the initial firm that gave rise to all these spin-offs actually recedes. And so the clusters are seemingly able to prosper not just because there's this dominant firm that, that sort of grows very large, but because it's these spin-offs that are coming in and um, expanding upon what could have been done just by, by a single firm. And so we like to make the comparison in the semiconductor industry of uh, Silicon Valley, which succeeded based on a whole bunch of spin-offs coming out of Fairchild and their spin-offs spin-offs, whereas there was another uh, early dominant firm, Texas Instruments in Dallas, that did not uh, give birth to so many spin-offs and did not create such a cluster in Dallas. Uh, the remaining stylized facts here are more focused on the performance of spin-offs um, compared to uh, other entrants and, and compared to other kinds of spin-offs. Um, we see that spin-offs perform better than other entrants. They, uh, their performance seems to correlate with the performance of their parents. We're thinking about larger uh, firms as being also more successful here, so I'm using that somewhat interchangeably. Um, we're seeing that spin-offs that initially enter as successful or large uh, entrants continue to do better over time. Um, that they that spin-offs are even better in clusters than spin-offs outside of the clusters, and that spin-offs are producing products that are similar to their parents' products. And so. Going forward in the paper, I'll just give you the preview now because I won't have time to tell you about all of it. We're going to prove theorems that seemingly account for all of these stylized facts. Um, I won't be able to show you all those results, but I'll try to give you a flavor for what we're building into our model to try to account for all these stylized facts. So our basic assumptions are that an industry is composed of submarkets that are discovered through innovation. And a submarket we're conceiving of as a set of attributes. So an innovation means that you take some submarket that you already are producing in, and you discover a new attribute that you just add right on. And you can now enter this new submarket as well as retain the old one you had. We're going to assume that these innovations are just occur randomly. So there's just some um, there's just some chance that I discover one but we're going to assume that it's a branching process. So for each innovation that I've already discovered, that's another opportunity to discover uh, another one. So our intuition here is just firms are building off what they know. Right? This is organizational learning. If they already have experience in one submarket, they can expand into something that's related. And this means that more diversified firms have more opportunities to expand and grow. When firms discover these new submarkets, we just want to keep things as simple as possible in the model, just to focus on the intuition of how the spin-off process is working. So just for simplicity, we're going to say a firm gets to monopolize any submarket it discovers. We're going to say that the, su the success a firm has in pursuing a submarket depends on the attributes that characterize the submarket. So each attribute has some quality, and the higher the quality, the more successful we expect the submarket to be. But it's going to be random. There, there's still going to be some variation there. Um, and we're going to assume that most of these innovations are going to fail. So even, even a high quality sub market is more likely than not to fail. But there's some chance it'll succeed. So when a firm discovers this innovation, we assume that there's some chance that it doesn't actually keep this this new submarket in-house, some chance that a spin-off forms to pursue it. So conditional on discovering an innovation, 
we're just going to say that there's a constant probability alpha, this exogenous chance that a spin-off forms to pursue that new submarket rather than the incumbent firm pursuing it. And then if this new submarket turns out to be profitable, the spin-off can enter. If the turns out that it can't generate any demand, then the spin-off just never gets started in the first place. So there's a bit of a selection effect here. And outside startups can also enter the industry. We're just going to conceive of them as discovering submarkets that are characterized by a single attribute. And they arrive at their own rate, and they can choose a location. We're just going to say in proportion to the share of overall economic activity in that region. But spinoffs we're going to assume are always locating wherever their parents are located. So our intuition here is that spinoffs originate when they have an opportunity to. They originate when there's some new idea that gives them a, a market niche. Um, we're sort of building in with that assumption the idea that spinoffs are going to produce products that are similar to their parents because the new submarket that's discovered is very similar to the old one. It's just one new attribute added in. Uh, but once a spinoff enters, its product lines can gradually diverge from its parent. Uh, because each, both the spinoff and the parent can continue to innovate in separate directions. So with what goes forward then in the paper, we present these results that try to account for the remaining 10 stylized facts. Uh, the, the one piece that I'll try to focus attention on right now is the facts about um, agglomeration. And what we're going to do here is use Ellison and Glazer's model of, um, of imagining firms entering a, an industry randomly as creating a benchmark for how much, um, how much localized activity we would, we would expect just by chance. And then, according to their model, um, you can use a measure that, that accounts for the fact that there's a finite sample of firms. They might occasionally, uh, you might just have like a little bit of, uh, of a lump of activity in one place just because the distribution of activity is discrete. And their index is going to account for that and give an expected value of zero if firms were to enter randomly. And what our model is then going to do is explore what happens to this index if firms if the outside entrants do enter randomly, but these the spin-offs enter exactly where their parents had had been producing. Uh, so before even trying to show you any results, if I dare mess with this computer again, I'm going to try to show you a simulation of this. Well, in the interest of time, maybe I'll show you a simulation after. <laughs> Um. All right, let me skip through, through the theorems, which you can ask me about if you're so inclined. Um. Okay, so the, the model that, that we come up with is able to account for these stylized effects these stylized effects without assuming any agglomeration economy is built in. Uh, and I might just want to say something about that assumption. Uh, so we have some patterns that seem to suggest that um, firms in clusters uh, are more successful than firms outside of clusters. Even, say, spin-offs in clusters are more successful than spin-offs outside of clusters. It, it turns out that we might think about that even still being driven by the heritage of the firm. So even without agglomeration economies, we can explain all of this evidence. Uh, and there are some industries where it doesn't seem that outside entrants that aren't spin-offs perform any better in clusters than outside of clusters. So this might make you question how, how extensive these uh, agglomeration economies are uh, for, for generating uh, the, the cluster we see. Of course, there are definitely some industries where we, we, it would be crazy to think that agglomeration economies don't play a role, right? There's just some obvious ones. Um, and so generally, this model is not at all inconsistent with agglomeration economies acting on top of it. It's just saying that a lot of the patterns that we see could be generated 
by this process as well. And so, um, at best, we think the agglomeration economy story is incomplete. So the, the big picture, what this model offers us is in some sense a new perspective, where the typical perspective is we see patterns of clustering, and economists would say, well, let's, let's attribute that to incentives, right? So if we see clustering, it must be because firms want to enter into these regions, either because there's some natural advantage in this region, or because there's some benefit from being located near these other firms. And indeed, I think incentives play a role in shaping behavior. I think that perspective is important. But I think if we only take that perspective, we're missing another perspective, which I also think is important, which is the perspective that opportunity matters as much as incentives. And in this model, it's innovation that's creating an opportunity for spin-offs to form and for firms to grow. So with that, I'd like to thank you for giving me a chance to speak to you. And uh, I also felt honored to have the opportunity to work with Steve and to continue his line of research. understand the question you're asking like are we exploring what kinds of innovation right. are, are occurring so the characteristics of the, of the companies we Which say that they can, are innovative so see, is, is it just flash technology flash. that they're exploiting or are they taking okay. sitting so, up because there are market yeah. gaps so I, I i think the theory is not being specific at all about what we're assuming is the nature of innovation um, and so I, i'd like to take the most general approach and and say that this theory could accommodate all kinds of innovation, whether it's a new product, whether it's a new mechanism for producing a product at cheaper, at lower cost, whether it's a new organizational structure that allows the firm to um, recruit better talent. You could imagine all of these things generally being kinds of innovation that could be incorporated into uh, entering a new submarket. Uh, and you guys have helped so my me. My question is, would you like to run your model? Yes, yeah, so, I, so I can show you this model. Um, so what you should think about happening here, uh, if I can, so what you should think about happening here is we have 51 different columns. Think about that roughly as the 50 different states in the District of Columbia, although I wasn't able to import um, data on, on their uh, different size here, so it's not such a great um, simulation here. It's a much better simulation than actually using the paper. Um, and let me slow it down and start running it. So each, each dot that forms here, we should think of as another firm that's uh, randomly arriving in the industry. And um, most of these early entrants, we can see there are no spin-offs yet. So these are just all outside entrants that are randomly arriving. The size of the dot is telling you about uh, the size of that firm, how, how much it's discovered. Um, and if we speed this up, eventually we'll likely see clustering. We don't see it every time because it's a random process, but we tend to see some degree of clustering. Um, see, it's maybe a, a visualization of the, the regions that seem to get ahead are able to continue to, to grow more quickly. I can let that play for a second. Thank you. That's great. So David, I think had a really good idea. We have about uh, just shy of 10 minutes left. Um, and maybe for the last 10 minutes, instead of trying to think of a Q&A with the authors, 
maybe Q's with no A's. So this is a, a big kind of issue that was uh, dominating Steve's thinking um, you know, in the last little bit. And we've had a, a three excellent presentations to stimulate. So imagine thoughts to the ether that might stimulate uh, further ideas or conversations. But 10 minutes for the group to uh, talk a little bit about uh, firm heritage and regional agglomeration. Please. I have a question, uh, I'm not an economist, probably pretty obvious, but I've been around it for a long time. <clears throat> and my question is, Russell, it's really directed to you, Russell, but it really applies to some other people. Suppose we take the model that you develop here and apply it to the university in terms of um, um, uh, spin-offs, innovation, attraction to clusters, stability of, of departments, um, and so on. Could it possibly work? Um, when you think about the character of this place uh, as a university, which has certain unique dimensions to it, um, whereas it, well, university is entirely different than the firms that you've been describing. I, I think it definitely applies. I, I, I think the idea of innovation, I think of very broadly, is it's not necessarily just a firm producing a product, but it's, it's sort of any organization producing what they're trying to produce, right? And so it's a research university producing new ideas. I think the insight that people build off of ideas that they have already come across is exactly how I found research works. Please. I, I, like an, I like this analogy and have explored it, um, but I think there's one major difference, which is that typically you cannot enter the university where you come from, and that means because in most regions you only have one university that could hire you. You cannot have this cluster and you think, except in places like Boston, Cambridge, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. um, and the Bay Area. And, uh, they are on New York City, and these are leading places for the union. Other thoughts, ideas? Questions to the ether? Please. So, where do the great firms come from? Right? I mean, if, if these great firms found industries, then, then, then where did they come from? Right? Is it, are, are, we, are we sort of bound by the fates? Right? We have to wait for one of these great firms to arise. So I, I'm wondering if the answer lies perhaps not in, in nanoeconomics, but the next level down, which might be picoeconomics. <laughs> right? Is it possible that when a great opportunity arises, really smart people tend to congregate together? Right? You know, uh, Ransom Olds becomes the cool place to be uh, in the nascent auto industry. Fairchild becomes the cool place to be. So really cool people, smart people, gather together, and then eventually they fall out with one another. Right? Um, but it's because the smart people initially found each other, right, in a great firm that made it great. Um, and it's their interaction with each other that makes them great as they go on to form the next, uh, the next way. I had sort of a similar idea about that idea of like greatness both at the firm level, greatness but also at the regional level. Like when when does that moment you know occur where in some sense that you know that greatness itself has some form of an externality. You know, so the you know, the early spin-off process, you could say it's well spin-off of that region, it just happens to be the people stay close. Right? But when does that region kind of you know grab that identity and have those extra properties? You know, at what you know, Fairchild wasn't great all the way through, it was just seemed to have been great for a moment. Right, and that moment, you know, was quite precipitous. So I think some of that idea of trying to understand the, you know, the arrival of some of these moments, but also maybe the length, you know, some of those moments as well. Interesting, please. Just picking up on what Lee said about people recognizing opportunities and going together. So I'm, I'm actually doing a project right now where I'm looking at not just individual mobility, but groups of people. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a friend who works at NASP, the, you know, the controls company, and he said, oh yeah. Five of us came from online. Before that, three of us worked at Tell Me. And we just follow each other around. You know? Wait for our options to expire, then we leave. Go find out what's cool. And what's interesting is that we don't see a lot of Fairchild founding teams where it's eight people who left together. But what happens is after the founding team, then they go back and they grab groups of people and pull them into the spinoffs. And that seems to be, I mean, I've just very early on this, but it seems to be a lot of what's going on is you're just importing huge chunks of talent, people who know how to work together, the people you know before. Yes? So I, I guess I'm kind of wondering, when are there not clusters? So what is it, and, and, and I'll frame it kind of this way, we can generate lots of mechanisms to 
create clusters. I'm kind of curious, I want to, like, when can the science get to the point where we can see an, a, an early stage industry hypothesize, if successful, what's the probability of we do a, a cluster? And I'll give you an example, which is a little bit of pocket history, which means I'm distorting history a little bit, but just, just for, for the event. So if you think about Netscape, Netscape moved from the Midwest to Silicon Valley quite explicitly. Right? That was the whole story of Mosaic and Jim Clark goes and brings them to, to Silicon Valley and all of a sudden we have an internet cluster in you know the web, all that web activity is happening in you know just outside of Palo Alto. So why is that? Why couldn't it have stayed in where it was? Uh, and why did it have to go to some place where there was already these agglomeration economies? Because their bosses screwed up, right? That's the story. Why the founder moved to Silicon Valley was uh, some, some government government agency that tried to appropriate all their intellectual property. But they didn't go next door to Champagne or Van. Right. Why did they choose to do that? And, and so I, I think so we, should, we should set that in and, and have the kind of factual criticism. So I want to say that it strikes me that the current Silicon Valley um, situation and San Francisco Silicon Valley is underexploited and a great opportunity for research. Why haven't we heard about all the Google spin-offs? Are they there and we just don't know about it? You know, I mean, we know, we know all these young people are moving to San Francisco if they want to be part of this new wave. And they're not coming out of Google or Yahoo, right? They're going there because that's where all the other young people are doing this. So, um, it just strikes me as a, a great opportunity and maybe underexploited. I, I might add that I think in some of Steve's work, he had this idea that by uh, forming a spinoff, it's like creating more than than what would have been had you not left. And yeah, I think in in this conception of the theory, it's the idea that it's the underlying innovation that's important, and where it takes place is is less important. And so I might think that maybe Google is just doing a better job of of avoiding these disagreements, right? That they just have a workplace that people want to be a part of. And that, that might be something that other organizations might want to imitate. And there might be something down the road in terms of if you think about counterfactuals, you almost want to think about doing the, like, what does comparative work look like instead of a series of in-depth cases? Because part of that is going to be saying, well, what might have happened elsewhere? Or, you know, so I think and that's my, my suspicion is massively labor intensive. One more, one more question and then uh, we're going to give you place, I'll, I'll try to keep it fast. Um, one is I was something there was someone was um, there was talk earlier in this about embodied knowledge. I'm thinking literally almost knowledge embodies that there was, it was just sort of an operation. Um, the other um, other thing, and this is sort of a maybe a getting towards a policy question, which I'm groping towards, is let's say you know you're a company or a government agency or something, you want to be one of the cool kids who are innovative and all that, and uh, you're located in some really boring place, um, which I'll we can all think of those. Um, and um, Scram, that's right. All right. Um, so, um, so um, you yeah, know, one, one hypothesis and agglomeration one is, I know, let's move our whole team to Silicon Valley, and then we'll be cool. And what the whole thrust of what Clapper's work um, getting from that is, yeah, that's really not going to work. You'll be idiots wherever you are. It doesn't work. You might have a shot at this if you um, maybe find a good team of people in Silicon Valley and don't mismanage them too badly, maybe. But I'm thinking there's a whole direction of questions here that kind of, that this suggests where, you know, we all know agglomeration seems to do all this magic, but what is it, where does that magic come from and maybe how can one capture it? Yeah. I mean, well, Actually, I don't want to be rude because it's my job. Yeah. Stimulate the next conversation, but my job was also to kill the next conversation. <laughs> <laughs>